where the transitory lands of the Lords of Cinder converge. How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for all of the support on the Dark Souls 1 optimized damage and optimized DPS video. And as promised in some of the comments, today we return this time to Dark Souls 3, my favorite game in the series, to take on the challenge in Lothric. This is going to run pretty much the same as the Dark Souls 1 video. However, it is important to note that I'm actually going to be doing this two different ways. So this is part one of a two-part video series. And in this part, we are going to be using weapons only. So if you don't see any spells, miracles, or pyromancies, just know that I am going to tackle this in that fashion as well, which will probably be my next video after this one. And as a general disclaimer, just know that thanks to the enormous amount of data that I went through to determine the maximum possible DPS, just know that there may or may not be some errors in some of the spreadsheets I was using and some of the numbers I found in the game's data file. So while this, I think, is relatively close or is the maximum possible DPS at the stage in the game that I'm playing at, it is possible that I missed a thing here or there. Anyways, enough about that. Let's pop into it. Starting off, we got to choose the class to start off this run with. And for us, that is going to be the Warrior class, which starts with 16 Strength, 9 Dexterity, 8 Intelligence, 9 Faith, and the Battle Axe. As we make our way to the first fight of the game, and my pick for the best tutorial boss in the entire series in Udex Gundir, I'll throw my stats up on screen and the variety of buffs that I'm using for each boss fight. The reason that we have to start with the Warrior is that the Battle Axe has the War Cry ability, which adds a 10% attack bonus to the weapon of choice. That, alongside its relatively quick moveset and high base damage, allows us to get an approximate DPS of 96 for the first fight in the game, which, given Udex's HP, is, is pretty good. And you'll see in this fight uh, that it goes pretty well, actually. I don't I usually employ parries in Phase 1, but this time I decided to forego that, and we take down Udex Gundyr in pretty quick fashion. Our first stop of the run is, of course, Fireling Shrine, where we do some shenanigans, including a tree jump, picking up a silver covetous ring, and also doing an early trade to get ourselves a large titanite shard. While we make our way to the high wall, let's discuss exactly what we are talking about when we mean DPS in terms of this run specifically. A damage formula makes this return from Dark Souls 1. Although in Dark Souls 3 and Elden Ring, I'm actually not sure about Dark Souls 2 when I'm recording this, there was a new stat that enemies have received called Absorption. Absorption is a pretty easy concept to understand. If a enemy has an absorption of 54%, that means the damage that you would calculate given the damage formulas is reduced down to 46% of the original value. And for Dark Souls 3, the maximum defense that any enemy actually has is 125. That's in the Ring City. So for the most part, you're really going to be sticking to those bottom three tiers of attack to defense ratio. For DPS, it's going to be a very similar process as well in Dark Souls 1. However, this time I went through and calculated a whole lot more animation speeds for a variety of different attacks. That includes every single R1, R1, R1 combo. R2, R2 combo, both one-handed and two-handed, as well as any weapon that has a damaging weapon art, such as Raptor Fury from the Crow Talons. A general way that we're going to go about calculating DPS is we're going to take both our physical and elemental attack, multiply them by their respective attack multipliers. We solve for the physical damage and reduce that by whatever the physical absorption is. Solve for elemental damage, do the same. We multiply the resulting sum of those two damages by any damage multipliers that we're rocking. We sum that final damage and then we divide that by the total length of the combination or single attack. And then we repeat that for every weapon and buff available at the stage of the game that we're at. So obviously this is a pretty lengthy process. Luckily there's a lot of data out there. However, one thing I couldn't find was the number of frames that it takes for every single weapon attack in the game. So I actually went through and cataloged all of those, which is why this takes so long. Now, obviously two weeks between videos isn't a crazy amount of time, but uh, you know, you gotta realize that I've been spending a lot of my time on this. I will make this spreadsheet available once I am comfortable that all or most of the numbers are correct. 
However, I got to spend a little bit more time on that just to refine it. As you'll see, uh, upcoming in this video, I actually caught an error after I fought the Deacons of the Deep that, that I'll talk about in that fight specifically. But I think for the most part, I have it correct. Anyway, back to some of the farming for materials in the high wall. Now, I didn't really mention this, but I'll mention it now. I'm not really going to grind for any levels, but for upgrade materials, I will make an exception. Or for covenant ranks in order to get miracles or whatever. Uh, specifically thinking of Dark Moon Blade uh, towards the back half of this run, I will grind for. But all of the stats that I'm using at the specific boss fight in the game are just going to be based on whatever I have kind of left over after those grind sessions. So there are a variety of different enemies in the high wall that can drop Titanite shards. And actually you can grab a second large Titanite shard by taking down the Drake on top of the high wall that breathes the fire. That, in addition to the large Titanite shard that we can get from Firelink Shrine, allows us to get a plus four weapon before we fight Vort. So for Vort, we're actually using a broadsword with no infusion at plus four, rocking a weapon attack rating of 230. That, in addition to the gold pine risen, which adds a 95 lightning attack to your weapon, uh, yields an approximate DPS of 164. And honestly, you know, I, I'm obviously at fairly high stats for this level in the game and rocking the plus four weapon. But if you, even if you can pick up a, like a plus two weapon before Vort and make good use of your gold pine resin, you should go down relatively quickly. I know this is kind of a big challenge for a lot of new players coming into Dark Souls 3. So if you're watching this as a new player, I would highly recommend figuring out how to get that gold pine resin stick to his hips and just repeatedly attack him he should go down relatively quickly for me this this whole fight lasted less than a minute and you will see that this is actually a fairly short fight in comparison to some of them that are upcoming that's just kind of thanks to how some of the boss fight mechanics in dark souls 3 work now experienced players will know that you can actually fight another boss on the high wall and trust me we are going to be doing the dancer early but I didn't really want to torture myself as I'm not great at that fight with a plus four weapon. And given that I used my last lightning pine resin against Vort, I decided that uh, there's some other upgrades that I'm going to go ahead and get before we try that fight. First step in the process is we head down to Undead Settlement, talk to Yol, make sure that we hollow ourselves nice and good, get our five free levels, and unlock Yuria as a vendor. She will sell us the Braille Divine Tome, which we can make use of right away by heading down and freeing Arena. We can give her the Tome and learn one of the best weapon buffs in the entire game. And I th what I think is the second best weapon buff in Dark Blade. We'll talk a little bit more about what I think the best buff is later in this run. In addition to that, there's a lot more stuff that we can go ahead and scour throughout the Undead Settlement, including unlocking Cornix as a Pyromancy Flame Teacher. We grab ourselves Flynn's Ring, which is incredibly convoluted in this game, and the Fire Clutch Ring. We're not done yet, however, as we continue on to the Road of Sacrifices. And uh, just as a bit of an interstitial, we do pick up our first paired weapon in the Gothard Twin Daggers. Or, sorry, the Brigand Twin Daggers. And, you know, if you've used weapon buffs in this game, you know that uh, paired weapons or fist weapons actually have diminishing returns whenever you use weapon buffs. So one of the reasons that this video took quite a bit was I actually had to go through and test out a variety of weapons as I couldn't find great information on exactly how well buffs take to certain weapons. The important thing to note from this video is that for paired weapons, which also include any fist or claw weapons, the standard attack only applies two-thirds of the weapon buff that you apply to your weapon. Most other weapons in the game apply 100%, but it is also important to note that for uh, weapon skills, the total amount of damage added per hit on your weapon skill is usually a whole lot lower. I may make a video on this as well at some point once I have all the data, but a good example would be the Cellsword Twin Blades. Normally these are talked about as one of the best weapons in the entire game, and if you're wondering why I'm not using them, well, in addition to that, if you use the, in addition to the paired weapon uh, reduction that you get, using the spinning sp slash weapon art with those twin blades only applies about 20 percent of the weapon buff per hit i understand that especially when you look back at the dark souls one and ricard's rapier just given how much dps we could output with that weapon 
why they went ahead and reduced some of the efficacy of the weapon buffs but it is severely diminished for a lot of very powerful weapons which is why you'll see we're going to be sticking with a very small selection of weapons as we continue on throughout this run We've got a couple more errands to run before we take on our next boss, and that is both heading down to Fair and Keep, picking up a couple of extra large Titanite shards, and then sending Orbeck back, back to Firelink Shrine, talking to Yuria, letting her know that he's there and that she perceives him as a threat, taking Orbeck down in a one-on-one, -on -one, and then going ahead and grabbing his ashes, showing Yuria that we have killed Orbeck, and she will reward us with the Marion Blade, which is a plus 20% damage boost to all available sources of damage when it's held either in your primary or offhand. Finally, after all that running around, we could take on the third boss of the run. This time, it's going to be the Crystal Sage, as there is a lot of stuff that we can acquire after killing the Crystal Sage. We also have the ability to infuse our weapons with some sharp gems that we picked up along the way. And with some of the grinding that we've done to get our faith up to 25 in order to use Dark Blade, we have a pretty high damage weapon and a pretty high weapon buff. This in concert with both the Marion Blade and Flynn's Ring lead us to have an approximate DPS of just under 400. I do want to point out that I did make a brief mistake in this fight as well. As the DPS I'm showing in the graphic on screen is based on the R2R2 attack with no charges. But in this fight I was using the charge attacks and I caught that error after I went back and double checked some things for my next fight. But either way, I mean, we're still doing tons of damage with the Crystal Sage. I don't think it really matters in that respect. Now that we've taken down the Crystal Sage, we can go to the Cathedral of the Deep, talk to Gale, and enter the Painted World for the first time. This is actually where we're going to be, where we're going to be farming large Titanite shards. And unfortunately, these things drop from the Corvian Knights, which are incredibly annoying to kill, especially at low levels, as they do a ton of damage. And given that we're only rocking a plus four weapon, they take quite a while to fight and kill. With enough patience, however, we are able to get enough Titanite shards to push our weapon all the way to plus six. I do think there are two chunks available somewhere in the painted world that mean we could get our weapon to plus seven, but I wasn't 100% sure about that, so I'm just going to use a, a plus six weapon for the time being, at least for our next fight. But before we leave the painted world, we can go pick ourselves up a Titanite slab for later. And it's back to the Cathedral of the Deep to pick up yet another tome. However, this time, because we have purchased a Dark Miracle from Arena, we have to go back to Udex Gundir's Arena to kill Eljum, which will teleport Arena back to Firelink. And we're going to purchase our first body buff spell of the run in Deep Protection, which kind of acts like a mini power within, giving you a 5% damage boost to all damage sources when active in addition to some additional damage absorption and stamina regeneration. And honestly, you know, this is this is a pretty good spell. Um, if you haven't ever used it before, I would definitely take a look, as it doesn't carry the harsh penalty that Power Within does in the HP drain, and it, it's pretty good all around. Anyway. It's going to be back to the high walled face off against the Dancer of the Boreal Valley as she guards a ton of super important upgrades that we can make for this run. For this fight again, we are still rocking ourselves the Sharp Broadsword. We have a little bit of increased damage from Dark Weapon. We have the Deep Protection and of course still rocking the Marion Blade and Flynn's Ring. For a total DPS of approximately 515, and for the rest of the fights in this video, I'm not going to go through and read every single buff that we're using, but uh, just get kind of give you a taste. There, there are still a couple of really powerful upgrades that we can get in Lothric Castle. Uh, to the fight itself, this is actually one of the cleaner dancer fights I've ever done. I've tried to kill her at low levels before, and it is a bit of a challenge, as I find her moveset a little bit difficult to dodge, especially in Phase 2. Phase 1 I can handle pretty easily. But uh, I gotta say, this is probably one of the cleaner dancer fights that I've ever had in all of my playthroughs of Dark Souls 3.
Now that the dancer is dead, we can make our way up to Lothric Castle, which has a ton of super important upgrades for this run. The first, of course, is the Red Tearstone Ring, which is a 20% damage boost. Gathia's Chime, which is a chime that scales both with faith and intelligence. Uh, one thing to point out about this chime and a couple of others in the game, as well as some staves, is that the total spell buff that you see on the stat screen only applies to dark miracles and for chimes specifically the total we'll call it spell efficiency for stuff like uh, lightning spear or wrath of the gods only takes into account your faith scaling on the chime that's about as much as i'm going to get into it for this but uh, just know that when you're using something like lightning weapon to buff your weapon you're going to want to be using a more heavily focused faith chime or talisman. You can also grab ourselves the sunlight straight sword which is a 11.5% damage increase and the braille divine tome which will allow us to purchase a blessed weapon from arena. So in addition to all the upgrades that we were able to acquire in Lothric Castle, we are also able to farm for some Titanite chunks in both the Consumed King's Garden as well as in Lothric Castle. With all those in hand and a plus 9 weapon, I made my way over to the Deacons of the Deep as this will unlock some new areas, specifically Irithyll and Anorlando. And if you recall at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that I actually had a mistake in this run where I used the wrong weapon for these guys. And for whatever reason, I had a mistake where I was counting three hits of damage for the Great Scythe and Corvian Great Scythe, the latter of which I actually used in this fight, whereas obviously it is only two hits of damage on the R2-R2 combination attack. Uh, the weapon I should have been using was a refined broadsword, but I figured that the Deacons are pretty easy. You know, we do quite a bit of damage, as you can kind of see in this fight, so I didn't really feel like going back and redoing this fight with the same stat setup. And I figured, you know, I don't, I don't really think it matters because, the, the, again, the Deacons are so easy. And, uh, you know, that's that's just kind of the decision I made. I think it serves a good reminder that, uh, you know, with the amount of data that I had to go through and, uh, you know, just the fact that I'm playing a video game, this is, this is kind of supposed to be fun. So, uh, you know, despite that mistake, just please remember not to take this as a serious 100% accurate guide for the maximum DPS possible in Dark Souls 3, but uh, rather some loose guidelines. With the Deacons done, we can make our way to the Abyss Watchers as there's not any additional upgrades that we can get at this stage in the game. And we're basically using the same setup that we should have been using for the Deacons, but this time we are actually using the Refined Broadsword. And for this fight, we also make use of the Backstabs. I don't have the numbers for those uh, on screen, but uh, I think you can kind of see that using that first backstab and then hitting the R2, R2 combo whenever they're standing up uh, makes this fight super easy. Uh, you know, I kind of mentioned how the dancer fight was maybe the easiest one that I've had in all my time playing Dark Souls 3. Well, this has got to be the easiest Abyss Watchers fight I've ever had in Dark Souls 3. With the Abyss Watchers taken care of, we can make our way into the Catacombs of Carthus to pick up another Pyromancy Tome, this one being the Carthus Pyromancy Tome, and take this back to Firelink Shrine and learn Carthus Flame Arc. And then we make our way over to High Lord Wolnir. Funnily enough, the best weapon buff that we can make use of against Wolnir is that Carthus Flame Arc. Uh, this is a pretty sloppy fight against Wolnir by my estimation. But uh, just given the level of damage that we're able to output, it still goes relatively smoothly as we don't see any of the skeleton summons. So High Lord Wolnir goes back down to the abyss. With Wolnir down, we go to Irithul to pick up a couple of clutch rings, as well as a new miracle, that is the magic clutch ring from Irithul the Boreal Valley, the dark clutch ring on our way down to the profane capital, as well as lightning blade outside of the area where you get transported to Arch Dragon Peak. 
Pontus Sullivan is up next, and he is definitely one of my favorite boss fights in Dark Souls 3, given the fact that you can beat him in so many different ways, including using parries, and, you know, ranged attacks work well, but he does have some very quick gap-closing moves. However, obviously, we're sticking with that refined broadsword, as it is still the best option for this stage in the game. Spoiler alert, that is not gonna change. And while I did not do any of the numbers in terms of how long each boss fight took, I think if you were to exclude the portion where we are running up to Pontus Sullivan, this might be the shortest boss fight that we've had so far in this video. Before we make our way up to Anorlando, I figure let's stop down in the Tomb of the Great Lord, get hitched, and then uh, head up and join one of the best covenants, but maybe the worst covenant for people going for the 100% in Dark Souls 3 in the Blades of the Dark Moon. If you have any experience in farming the Silver Knights on the Anorlando staircase, you will probably have PTSD for what's about to come next, as we do indeed have to grind out all 30 souvenirs of reprisal. Well, 28 if you consider the two static drops that you can get in-game. But this unlocks another weapon buff and the final weapon buff that we acquire in this run. And then we also have to turn around and pick up a chime that uh, mysteriously appeared on a chair. Who knows how that got there. With where we are at in the game, there are only a couple of different improvements that we could make to our run. One of them being acquiring the Lightning Clutch Ring from Arch Dragon's Peak, which of course is gated behind Osiris. So that is the next boss fight on our to-do list. And ironically enough, despite the fact that we don't have the Lightning Clutch Ring, that is still our miracle weapon buff of choice, as Osiris is one of the few enemies in the game that has a negative absorption to a elemental type. In his case, of course, it is Lightning. After taking down Osiris, we can go pick ourselves up an emote, head back to Irithyll, and make our way over to Arch Dragon's Peak, where we can pick up said Clutch Ring. And then we have a fight against the Ancient Wyvern, which there's really not a point in optimizing it. Uh, for whatever it's worth, it is still kind of the same setup with the Broadsword, although this time it would be with Lightning Blade and the Lightning Clutch Ring. But given that any plunging attack does 100% of the Ancient Wyvern's health, I didn't really see the point in doing any numbers or a graphic for this specific fight. Another reason that we popped here is we can pick up a Titanite Slam from where we fight Havel. With everything in hand, I figured it was high time that we make our way to our next Lord of Cinder and Aldrich Devourer of Gods. A quick point on this fight is that Aldrich actually has a couple of different absorptions based on where you hit him. But the ones that I'm showing on screen are in the optimal way where you hit him in the head. It might be the body as well where he has a lot lower absorptions, which is the reason that our hits are doing a, maybe a little bit less than what I am showing on screen. Uh, even despite that, however, this fight was insanely easy as we got some great RNG with his first attack. And it's on to Yorm after this. And speaking of Yarm, similar to the Ancient Wyvern fight, really the best option in terms of melee attack is the Storm Ruler weapon art. But we do still make use of all of the other buffs that we have been rocking, including the Marion Blade and Deep Protection. The only other thing about this fight is that whenever we do get him staggered and we can do the repost on his head, we actually switch over to a plus nine sharp dagger, which has the highest motion value out of any weapon in the entire game. And that, combined with its attack rating, does more critical hit damage than any weapon at this stage with our stat spread.
Given that we have taken down three of the Lords of Cinder, where there's really only one place left, at least in the base game, and that is to take on the Dragon Slayer armor, which is one of my favorite fights in the entire game. He also gets off the last big upgrade that we can get in Power Within, and ironically enough, despite all the grinding that we've done for Dark Moon Blade, this is the one time that we use it as the rest of the fights that we are going to be doing are actually going to be with Blessed Weapon, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. Either way, the Dragon Slayer armor, again, it is a little bit tricky. You know, you got to watch out. He's pretty quick despite his size, but uh, has a relative weakness to magic. So if you're struggling with a Dragon Slayer armor, I would go ahead and recommend actually switching over to sorceries as opposed to grinding out 30 souvenirs of reprisal. Trust me, it'll save your mental health. With the Dragon Slayer armor down, we go into the Grand Archives and pick up Power Within. Again, our last big upgrade for this run. And we actually head back to the Cathedral of the Deep to undergo a rebirth. And we reallocate our stats, heavily investing in both strength and dexterity, while leaving us enough faith to cast Bless Weapon, as this is going to be our miracle weapon buff of choice, as opposed to some of the elemental damages that you get from the other miracles, what this does is it actually multiplies the physical attack rating of your weapon by 1.075. So with high stats and a refined infusion, this will generally win out over some of the other weapon buffs, especially if you are rocking power within as you also gain the benefit of some HP regeneration. With all these buffs in hand, I decided to go and face off against Champion Gundir as I wanted the Coiled Sword Fragment, which would allow us to trade for another slab should we come to need it. Although I will say that actually never happened. This is yet another fight that I'm not really showing any of the numbers as I decided to go with Parry and Repost strats. And let me tell you, if I had a little bit quicker actions on the sticks, I think I probably could have taken them down in two Reposts. But instead, I needed a couple of uh, stray hits from the dagger after we did that second one. Now, for the Twin Princes, if you've ever looked up a guide on how to cheese them, you'll know that in Phase 2, if you end Phase 1 at the correct spot on the carpet, you can actually drop aggro from the bosses and you can reapply your buffs. So knowing that that was, in fact, something that you could do, I went into this fight twice the first was with the intent to go ahead and take down Lorien, although if I would have killed Lothric on this attempt, I probably would have kept it in as well. But once we have a fight where we are able to kill Lorien for the first time in the correct spot, we can go through the process of resetting up all of our buffs, and you can really see the damage output that we can take to uh, what is probably my favorite boss in the entire Soul series. And from the time of our first swing to when the mark my words appear on the screen, the phase two portion of this fight only took about 17 seconds in total, which is nuts. Now before we put our ribbon on this run and end it with the Soul of Cinder, what about the DLCs? Well, uh, unfortunately, due to some of the uptime that we need to keep our buffs active for, you know, cycling between power within, making sure our Flynn's ring is active, you know, swapping miracles, making sure we have enough MP to cast all this stuff, you know, I, I just kind of found that it wasn't worth it, and I decided that, you know what, if I can just get the credits to roll by beating the Soul Ascender, that's all I was really going to do for this run because I know that given some of my calculations, the magic based run is actually quite a bit stronger in terms of raw DPS. Uh, you know, I will show a couple of examples of me fighting the demons, the demon prince, um, but you know, specifically for Dark Eater Madeer and Slave Knight Gale, you know, with just how long those fights are, despite our fact that we have some insanely high DPS, you know, it just really isn't fun. It's kind of like doing a soul level one run, although obviously we have way better damage output. But uh, just one mistake on those guys, and again, trying to keep all the buffs active at one time, it was way too much micromanagement for me, so I just decided to cut it there and then head over to the Soul of Cinder. 
I just mentioned all the DLC bosses, but the Soul of Cinder is kind of similar in that vein where the phase transition is a bit annoying to try and work through with trying to keep all your buffs active. So ultimately, some of the footage that I have for this boss fight, you know, it was just like three, four, five minutes of running around, dying, and then coming back and trying it again. So uh, overall, the fight itself just was not that enthralling, so I really heavily edited it down for this. Anyway, a bit of a disappointing end. You know, a lot of the mid to even some of the late game fights, particularly against the Twin Princes, you can really see just how crazy high you can get your DPS to in Dark Souls 3, but that really pales in comparison to some of the numbers that we were outputting in Dark Souls 1. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, be on the lookout for the part two of this series in which I tackle the exact same challenge doing magic. That being sorceries, miracles, and pyromancies, which hopefully should not take quite as long to put out given the fact that I have all of the numbers. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. This was pretty fun to make and fun to route despite the kind of interesting end to the video hope you all enjoyed if you did feel free to leave a like a comment or a subscription and we'll see you all in the next video thanks so much